life. I will say this about investing. Everything you do learn is cumulative. What I learned at 20 is useful. Welcome to another episode of Equity Mates, a podcast that follows our journey of investing. Whether you're an absolute beginner or approaching Warren Buffett status, our aim is to help break down your barriers from beginning to dividend. My name is Bryce, and as always, I'm joined by my equity buddy, Ren. How are you going? I'm very good, Bryce. Good to be back here again. Yeah, back in the hot seat, talking stocks, talking markets, talking what we've learned. Yeah. Can't wait. Learned a lot. You, um, I was listening back to our episode from last week, Uh-oh. and you had a lot of homework. I did. So, I hope you've done it. We'll be checking your work later. <laughs> um, but we got a big episode. We're going to talk about what we've learned. I'm going to check on your homework. Nice. Um, one of the things that you said you were going to do was bring a worked example of your ETF investing checklist. Mm-hmm. So, I'm excited to hear that. Um, we're hearing, uh, we're learning a lot from a few companies reporting uh, in Australia. It's obviously US reporting season, but there are a few Australian companies that report quarterly. So, we wanted to talk about what's happening here at home. And then we're going to play Book Bonanza again. Yes. Epic, uh, epic end to this episode. It was a lot of fun last week going head to head with Simon from our team. But this week, we are fortunate to have our first community member joining us on the show to, uh, to try and win a book from your book collection yeah, so really yeah, yeah. excited to and, close out that episode and last week the three questions were about big tech and we learned a bit about that okay uh this week the air, the industry that we're going to be uh learning about and there's some interesting stuff in there airlines love it yeah, luckily that's my favorite industry so <laughs> <laughs> but ren let's let's move on what we've learned this week um i did have some homework so i may as well kick it off this week Last week, I was talking about uh, coming across a market cap weighted S&P 500 versus a um, equal weighted S&P 500 ETF. And the homework was to go and actually look at whether or not equal weighted index outperforms over the long term. Well, we were saying that it was strange that in the past few years, the economic theory had been flipped on its head. And we were asking if over a longer period of time, the economic theory was correct or it was wrong. Yeah. And to just quickly recap, the economic theory is uh, equal weighted ETFs should uh, perform better in bull markets when you know growth stocks are doing well. But then market cap weighted ETFs that has more of the big, boring, slow guys should do well in bear markets where you get more defensive and like Commonwealth Bank and BHP come to the fore. But in America, that theory was flipped on its head over the last couple of years. Oh, no, over this year. This year. Right? Oh, no, and the five years. Yeah, five years. And so, you, you were going to go back in the history books and you've crunched the numbers. And I've gone back in the history books, Ren. Um, so, I have crunched the numbers. So, l- let's look at the America first, the S&P 500, and then we'll have a look at Australia. So, um, I went back to 2004, some, I could have gone back 1989, but the numbers became a little bit blurry. But uh, so, S&P 500, 2004 to today, and this is for market cap uh, weighted, so just the biggest stocks at the top, um, there was a return of 250%. Okay. Pretty good, by the way. Yeah. I'd be taking that. By the way, FYI. <laughs> 250% for market cap. And this is probably what the majority of us as investors are invested in when you get a broad-based S&P 500 index. The S&P 500 equal weight index from 2004 to today is 311%. So, pretty significant outperformance. Okay. Um, what is interesting is that when you do marry it up, it... It, uh, it actually tracks on the downside pretty similar to the S&P, but f- really cr- cranks up when, you, when it's on the upside. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, and similarly in Australia. So, um, since 2002, an, uh, the market cap weighted ASX 200 has returned 300%, whereas the equal weighted ETF has returned 404%. Mm. So, again, pretty significant outperformance over the last 20 years. And again, we can see here, and I'll put the chart up uh, on on the forum, 
uh, that again, it, it rips on the upside and, and tracks it pretty closely on the down. Yeah, you say it tracks it pretty closely, but looking at this chart, it, it, fur- it fell further because you, like, if you look at around 2008, I, I know us talking about a chart is not great, but um, 2006 to 2008, the equal weight rips and it's, it's a fair bit ahead. And then in the downturn, it actually ends up below. So, like, as a percentage, it fell a lot further. For, yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. Which is... So, I mean, like, the takeaway from this is the economic theory holds. Yes. The last few years have been the anomaly. So, now it's got me thinking about what I do with this because... Don't hurt yourself. <laughs> the amount of times you say that... <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it's got me thinking, and I don't have an answer for this, and maybe I'll take it as homework again, but um, it's got me thinking about how I approach indexes broadly. We can't keep doing Bryce homework. Just come ready. <laughs> <laughs> what um? What, okay, t- talk us through. Well, your it's thinking it's now. it's now made me think. Should I just change to equal weighted I o- mean, over a long term? Like the 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 maths and the maths is there, the theories there, and and the results are there. That I guess the question is: is the product there? So, uh, in Australia, beta shares have an S and P five hundred equal weight. Is that yeah, right? Yeah. Does anyone do ASX 200 equal weight? I haven't done my homework on that. Yeah. But I mean, like, if you're willing to wear more more pain on the downside, like, you know, in a bear market like this, if you're willing to see your portfolio go red. Well, you'll see why I'm thinking about it because uh, after we fi- find out what you've learned this week, we're going to do a checklist um, worked example for one of the st- ETFs in my portfolio, which tracks the S&P 500. So... It's going to be a nice comparison. So let's. Okay. So, that, so, so anyway, I've got a link uh, that I'll put in the forum as well that has some pretty detailed uh, mathematical explanation as to why outperformance uh, occurs for equal weighted. It's all to do with distribution of stocks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, pretty interesting read. So I'll put that in in the forum community.equitymates.com when this episode comes out on uh, on Monday. Cool. Do I have I done my homework? Do I pass? Yeah, yeah. Well, that was only that was only part one. The other part was this worked example, which I'm looking forward to. <laughs> yes, coming. Um, but yeah, yeah, I mean that's interesting. Does um, that surprise? Does no, that surprise you? No, no, not at all. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So anyway, I don't know what. The, the- it's funny that if 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 the, if it's not an unusual thing, and it's surprising that um, fundies or or maybe you know, or ETF providers don't push this product harder. Yeah. Yeah, it is. If it's like a, if it's known to generate better investing outcomes, it's like, why is there a a focus on market cap weighted? So I've just done a quick Google of arguments against equal weighted index. The beauty of podcasting is no one will know how long it took. Um, (laughs) It doesn't really look like... I mean, so uh, they have higher turnover, which leads to higher expense ratio and generally higher capital gains taxes. So one thing might be you pay higher fees. Yeah. But I mean, if you're, if, if you're, if you're outperforming, more, yeah. then yeah, they're more volatile and can fall more sharply during recessions. But we recognize that. Um, so, are sectors with high loss rates like information technology may underperform with equal weighting but like that's just to do to do with the the weighting in the index like yeah i I, the long the short of it is from a very cursory google there's not a lot of arguments against it really other than it's more volatile there's more risk um but like if you're willing to wear that risk Got me thinking. Got me thinking. Yeah. Got me thinking. All right. Well, what have you learned, Ren, this week? Two things from me. First of all, I just want to wish you a happy anniversary. Okay. For? We are into November, which marks 12 months from when the market turned. Okay. Our bear market anniversary. Okay. I I was going to say it's two years since we quit our jobs, but happy anniversary to that. (laughs) (laughs) That's a better anniversary. (laughs) Uh, But yeah, so November 2021, we were all riding high. We were buying NFTs. We were minting cryptocurrencies. We were- I was getting rug pulled. (laughs) (laughs) We were saying uh, Pokemon cards to the moon. What other stupid things were people saying in 2021? 
Oh, I mean, we're in a, everything was in a bubble. Oh, Asset ev- bubbles uh, galore. Everything was going to be Web three based. Web three. Um, yeah. If you're a, if you were a pre revenue startup, you could raise at stupid valuations. Life was good. Life was good. <laughs> <laughs> um, wow. So you brought some charts. I've done some charting of my own. Um, so we're, we're right in the teeth of a bear market. The actually. The ASX 200 is only down 5% in the past 12 months. Coal. <laughs> Coal. Coal. <laughs> Actually, yeah. yeah. Um, but the S&P 500 is down 19% in 12 months. So, is that technically a bear market then? Yeah, bear is 10%, isn't it? And then, no. And Correction's then 20. Anyway. Our stocks are down. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but we're down 19% in the past 12 months. But you hear this term bear market rally a lot or dead cat bounce. Um, and we're kind of in one now. The S&P 500 is up 5% since the end of September. And so I just had a look at the chart to understand this, this bear market rally phenomenon. So you could say we're down 19% in the past 12 months. Yeah. Or you could say in the past 12 months where down 3%, up 6%, down 10%, up 6%, down 9%, up 11%, down 16%, up 7%, down 12%, up 17%. I remember that one. That was recent. Down 17%, up 9%, down 4%. Yeah. And so just like it's not linear. Um, you know, top to bottom. But there are some like decent rallies in there, up 17%, up 11%. Yeah, well, I remember there was the, I think the 17% one, there was the- Is it done? Chit chat of, yeah, yeah, yeah. we're good, we're good, we're good. <laughs> You're know, calling the bottom. Um, and it was at that time that, and to his credit, that we had the Julian McCormack interview yeah. as we're ripping up through this 17%. And he's like, no, no, no. Yeah, there's more to there's come. There's more to come. Yeah. And, um, and here we are. And I think overnight we had the, the Fed, Bump up 0.75% again. Market took a hit. Still more to come. Yeah. So, I think that's just an interesting illustration of how our markets fall and this phenomenon of bear market rallies. All right. So, Ren, that was uh, your first thing you learned. What else have you learned before we move on? So, we often joke about new ETFs and how many ETFs are there are coming to market. Came across uh, a couple that I thought were interesting. Have you ever heard the phrase, buy the close and sell the open? Yes. Do you want to explain it? It's where you buy the close and sell the open. <laughs> There's often a little bit of a, a rally at the end of the day. You can jump in on that and then sell it the next morning. Yeah. It's like news comes out overnight and stock prices gap up overnight. And so, they're higher at the open and then they trend down over the course of the day. So, you buy it at the close when they're low and then overnight, investors get refreshed and they get excited about these stocks again and then they're, they're bidding higher prices at the open in theory. Yeah. Um, so anyway, two new two ETFs have come out to, I guess, give investors access to that idea of buy the close, sell the open. They're called night shares. There's the night shares 500, which does it for the S and P 500, and the night shares 2000 that does it for the Russell 2000. And Seriously active. I guess must be. Must be. Yeah. So I I actually don't. What's know- it tracking? Well, I think it probably. Or is this- like so, I haven't actually looked at the mechanism, but I assume it takes the S and P five hundred and buys them maybe every day at the close, and then sells them at the open, and then does nothing throughout the day, and then does the same thing again. Buy the close, sell the open. The management fee on that must be extraordinary. Well, you could probably automate it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, like, no, you've you got to pay. Couldn't automate. You've it, probably got to pay, pay. You're paying for a buy and sell every single day. Oh, you mean the brokerage on it? Yeah. True. Like the, the the cost of doing that, um, it's well, just getting more and more ridiculous. These are these are less becoming ETFs and more becoming hedge fund. Oh, like active management. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah they're just just listed active management, which is fine. Like an active ETF is. Yeah, is a, yeah, yeah, but yeah, it it shouldn't be confused as like a core 
low cost, broad, yeah, broad yeah, based. Yeah. It's not like oh, this is uh, the Night Shares five hundred is basically the S and P five hundred with yeah, a little with twist. A little spin on it's, it. Yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah. No, you're no. right. You're one hundred percent right. Um, but I guess so. Uh, I didn't look at exactly how they manage the ETF, but what I looked at first is is the thesis holding. Is the night shares thesis working? Do you want to hazard a guess? No. <laughs> You've nailed it. So let's look at the S and P 500 first. So the S and P 500 index versus the night shares 500 ETF. Night shares 500 launched on the 28th of June. So we got a couple of months of performance. Night shares 500. Oh, sorry. We'll do it the other way. S and P 500 is down 1.6 percent in that time. Night shares 500 is down 7.2% in that time. Fail. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The Russell 2000 versus the Night shares 2000. The ETF also launched on the 28th of June. I'm actually a big fan of the Russell 2000. Well, that is good because the Russell 2000 is actually up in that time. Yeah. Up 2.9%. Night shares 2000 down 8.1%. Ooh. That's almost 10% Ooh. difference wow. in a couple of months. Yeah, I don't even need to comment. <laughs> <laughs> so dumb. So anyway, uh, I, I guess the lesson there is just be careful of these exotic ETFs. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's more and more of them and it's just getting a little bit ridiculous. They need to change the name away from ETF because, yeah, anyway, there's a connotation with ETFs and... I don't like it. I don't like where they're going with it. Yeah. Or like index ETFs need a new name. Yeah. 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 Exchange traded active management e Tams. <laughs> Someone better than Bryce will anyway, come up with a name. Anyway, let's keep moving. We're in. We've got plenty to get through. So, uh, let's move on to the investing checklist that we've been working on over the last couple of weeks. Um we haven't got to the it's, single stock stuff yet, but... It's a very generous we you just said. We, that. I. <laughs> I have been working on over the last couple of weeks. I started out start, uh, building one for individual stocks, realized that there's probably a need to do one for ETFs first. This is an ETF heavy ep episode. It is, but that's we'll, okay. We'll get to some individual stock stuff, don't you worry. And then last week, um, you, you said, how about you come back with a worked example of my checklist against an ETF so we can put it in practice and see if it works. So, I've got one and I'm going to use the ETF uh, GGUS. GGUS is the stock ticker and it is a geared US equity fund hedged against, uh, well, it's hedged um, and its provider is beta shares. Um, and so, for, it's, so it's triple leveraged. Two point two eight percent, not quite triple. Oh, really? Yeah, two point oh. two times. There you so go. just Learn just new every day. So let's go and, through it, but um, because we can get to all of that. Oh, okay. I was just going to explain then what you meant by hedge, but all right, you will get to that. We'll get. Am to I that. jumping the gun? Jumping the gun. I'll shut up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think it is worth um, also. Uh, for transparency and, and disclaimer, uh, this is a position in my portfolio at the moment. In mine as well, if people care. In Ren's as well. <laughs> so, let's start at the top. If I'm thinking through this, what am I trying to do? My aim at the moment is to get exposure to the US and have it as part of my core portfolio, which we've spoken a lot about. So, that's the aim. If you were to do this without having actually bought the ETF, I now need to go through and use this checklist to determine whether or not GJUS fits the bill. What's your time horizon? Does that come into strategy or does that come later? Time horizon comes into purpose plan. What is my investing strategy? So for me, time horizon is the next 40 years. Okay. And this is something that I'm just going to have in there, maybe until I pass it on to my kids. This is just a forever position. Yeah. Probably more likely until you sell it to pay your kids exorbitant <laughs> Eastern Sydney school fees. But. <laughs> True. Uh, moving back to Wagga. Yeah. <laughs> so, I've got the checklist here and there's, I'm not. it's not a sort of a one out of five or anything like that. It's more of a yes, no checklist. And ideally, you get to the end and there's probably more yeses than there are no's. And there are some of them that are more important than the others in terms of price and those sorts of things. What are your thoughts? I'm just keen to get to the checklist. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go. Purpose plan. So, I think the first question I ask myself is, does this fit my investing strategy? So, firstly, that is to build a core por portfolio over a long period of time. And um, that, that's, that's really it. 
give me broad-based exposure to the US stock market. Okay. Does this fit? Yes. It's going to give me broad-based exposure to the US stock market because it tracks the S&P 500. Is it something that's good for a long period of time? My answer to that is yes, because it is broad-based, because it's tracking the S&P 500 and it is a geared stock. And for me, gearing over a long period of time, 2.2 times leverage, um, ideally is going to give me some pretty meaty returns. Mm. I think if you think about gearing for me, gearing is something that is probably better done over a longer period of time than trying to gear over two or three days. Yeah, and there's an important nuance there uh, that we need to explain because a lot of leveraged ETFs aren't great for a long period of time because of beta slippage, Yeah, which is really at, at its core rather than borrowing money to buy more of the uh, stocks in the ETF, a lot of ETF providers will like artificially construct it with options and stuff like that. And so they'll track daily returns, but over a long period of time, there'll be a discrepancy because they're just trying to match day-to-day returns. But and we actually, when we first talked about this ETF on the show, we thought beta shares were doing the same thing yeah. and we were told in no uncertain terms that they weren't. Yeah. Um, and so they actually just borrow money from a bank or something and buy more. Internally so it's leverage. like- it's leveraged in the same way that we would be leveraged if we borrowed money rather yes. than being leveraged through options. Yeah. So that's a, an important watch out. If you Maybe that should, needs to be a tick box. If it's if leveraged, how is it leveraged? Yes. Yeah. Good call. Um, so then does it sort of fit the way that I like investing and the way that I want to invest into my core portfolio, which is your dollar cost average? Uh, don't have to think about stock picking. I mean, in its in in its essence, an ETF allows me to do that. So, this is a this is an ETF that ticks that box. Cool. Any any questions or comments? Or makes sense. So the answer is yes. You, you generally don't have to ask if I have questions or comments. <laughs> True. I'll, I'll generally <laughs> jump know. in. <laughs> so then we move to positions, uh, and the question for me is. Is it true to label? Do the positions in the fund actually match the fund's objectives? Now, the fund's objectives are clearly stated as uh, giving us exposure to the top 500 US companies with tracking the benchmark of the S&P 500. You look at the holdings and that is exactly what it does. Yeah, I guess- It is true to label. <laughs> it, that gets a tick. I guess this becomes more relevant with thematic ETFs Very and stuff like so. that. Very much so, yeah. But yeah, ticket, let's So, for move. the purpose of doing that. Then, if I'm thinking about my- core portfolio you want it to be diversified you want it to be broad based so then you think is this a diversified etf by nature of what it's tracking 500 stocks market cap weighted yes if you then have a look at what that actually means 25 percent in it 15 percent healthcare 11 percent consumer discretionary 10 percent financials tick on diversified yeah it's all american though it is all American, but that's fine because for this purpose, I wanted a US-based exposure. Because let's say I take another example. There's a um, Global X. It was ETF Securities. They have uh, an ETF that tracks US tech, but it's got 10 stocks in it. So that's not something that's going in my poor portfolio. And I wouldn't say that's something that's diversified. Yeah. Different fund objective though. Yeah. It also has some Chinese tech in, doesn't it? Does it? Yeah, I think it's got Tencent and stuff. There you go. The Fang Plus one. Oh, yeah. 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 Top world tech stocks then. Maybe. Anyway, let's keep moving. Uh, and then the third <laughs> thing for me in, in positions is to make sure that it's not um, overlapping too much with other port, uh, stocks in my portfolio or other ETFs. As we've spoken many times before, no point buying a, an S&P 500 uh, and then buying a... Uh, top tech and then buying top pharmaceuticals and then buying top consumer discretionary because you're likely to have a fair bit of overlap. Um, so for me, against a lot of positions in my portfolio, there is some, but I'm, I'm okay with it. So it's a yes. Cool. Move on. I think, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> price, the very important one, because if I'm thinking about this for the next 40 years, you want to keep prices as low as possible. So the question is, is this the cheapest option? The answer here is actually no. There are cheaper options to get access to the S&P 500. 
The Vanguard US total stock market is 0.03% and iShares also have a core S&P 500 at 0.03% as well. The the management fee for this ETF GJUS is 0.8%. So it is more expensive. Wow. A lot more expensive. Yeah, a lot more expensive. The reason being, I imagine, is because of the internal leverage and the costs associated with that. Yeah, well, they got to pay interest on that. Yeah. I assume. So the question for me is then, if it's not the cheapest option out there, can I justify paying a higher price for it? And for me, I'm willing to pay more in management fee with the expectation that over 40 years, the leverage should outweigh the, the increase in, in, in cost. And I guess the, the two questions there are, first of all, like historically, that has that been the case since inception? The returns have outweighed the management fee. Like the, the returns of this ETF have done better than those the Vanguard and the iShares one you spoke about? We're going to get to that in a second. Okay. Yes. Um, that doesn't sound like a yes. Yeah, so, we'll put a pin in that. <laughs> put a pin in that because my second question is, you've kind of compared it to two ETFs that aren't exactly the same. Yeah. Are there other leveraged US ETFs? To your point earlier, not that I can find with the same leverage structure, if that makes sense. Okay. And I'm, surely, not, I'm surely, not interested in, in the synthetic stuff. But surely there would be in the US. Uh, I didn't look. Okay. Yeah. N- no currency hedging if you're buying it in the US stock market, but... Anyway. Yeah. Well, I think that's a, another point for me, which is further down the bottom is provider. I did want a domiciled Australian ETF. Um, and this is listed on the Australian Stock Exchange. Easy for tax. Um, and it's, yeah, it, it's, whilst I do have ETFs that are listed overseas, um, for this, I was happy for it to be Australian. Cool. Yeah. Okay. So you're giving it a tick on price. I'm giving it a, well, it's a, it's actually a no on price, but it's something that I'm willing to accept. So, yeah, yeah. 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 Let's look at performance because we know it, um, it, it should outperform uh, the benchmark. But since inception, Ren, the benchmark has returned, and this is since 2015, the benchmark has returned 9.21% per annum. Their fund has returned 9.95% per annum. So it's actually not a massive outperformance. There are some ye- there are some moments in there where it's significantly underperformed because yeah. it is leveraged. <laughs> like in the last year, the benchmark is down sixteen percent and the fund is down forty three percent. Yeah, yeah, and that that yeah, it's smashing my portfolio. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely smashing it. But then if you look at it at a calendar year point of view and you look over the last sort of five years where we've had this bull market, two thousand and sixteen, the benchmark returned eleven percent. The fund returned 23. 2017, benchmark was 21%. The fund returned 45%. We had a down year, 2018, benchmark was down about five. The fund was down 20%. So you can see that um, it, it's doing what it's supposed to, but um, I was surprised to see that since inception that it was so close to benchmark. Geez, 2019 was a good year for stocks. The benchmark was up 30% and the fund was up 70 or 69%. Yeah. Wait, is it, I assume the benchmark is just S&P 500. Yeah, yeah. S&P 500. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, um, historical performance, I mean, it's doing what it is supposed to. It did surprise me that, as I said, that it, um, it, it's so close. And then you could argue, well, why are you paying higher fees if, it, if since inception the benchmark is 9.21, the fund is 9.95? Probably the, it, that probably in favor of going for the cheaper option. Well, no, but it's also a quirk of timing. Yeah. Like the fund year to date has been cut in half. Yeah. Yeah. So, like you're looking at, at in, in a bear market, if we extend our time horizon a few years, theory would suggest mm. that those numbers start to look different. Mm. To 2021 fund. Yeah, look at that. Benchmark up 28%, fund up 66 what a few years we were having. <laughs> anyway, let's keep going. Third one is prospects, i.e. Is it, is it associated with an industry or a sector that's got some good growth outlook over the t- next time, sort of over my time horizon? It's the S&P 500. It's just going to keep chugging away. It's the top 500 companies in the States. It gets rebalanced as new upcomers keep coming through. 
we've spoken a lot on the show about how the stock market just allows you to get access to innovators and everyone doing amazing things. So, tick. Cool. <laughs> and then provider, is it one of the major providers? It's um, it's from BetaShares, one of Australia's largest providers, and it's domiciled in Australia, so it's easy for tax. So, a lot of yeses there. Great. That's why it's in my portfolio. <laughs> Epic. Um so I think if I was to do this again, um, I'd probably do a little bit more detail around uh, competitors. It was a bit easy to run through this because I already had it in my portfolio. Yeah, it would have been different if I'd just chosen a random, a random ETF. Yeah, uh, and tried to fit it against my investing strategy. But um, yeah, pretty straightforward. Great. Well, I think we. I, I don't really have any builds to be honest. That's fair. I mean, we're talking about a. A relatively vanilla ETF. Yeah. Obviously, it's leveraged, but yeah. yeah. Maybe there's a world where we do it for a thematic one, but I think uh, we're 30 minutes into this episode and I'm ETF'd out. All right, Ren. So, the ASX share market game is in full swing. We've got some ASX companies that are also reporting quarterly results, which we're going to go through. Yeah. Quarterly results used to be quite an American phenomenon, but like everything in culture... America's soft power seeps outside its borders <laughs> and infects our minds and more and more Australian companies are reporting quarterly. In fairness to them, it's a lot of Australian companies that have quite international operations or and quite global shareholder bases. Um, so, who knows? Maybe quarterly reporting will become more of a thing in Australia. But there's a few companies that caught our eye and we know that a number of people in the equity mates community are playing the ASX share market game at the moment yep. where you get uh, 50 grand in yep. fake money and you can, I guess, try and beat fellow investors, loan to invest, uh, get a sense for it over 12 weeks. So, 12 weeks, you can't have a long-term investment horizon here. You really have to think about what's going to be a catalyst while I'm investing and earnings reports are often great short-term catalysts yeah yeah so there's only a couple of weeks to go so three stocks here ren we've got amcor Qantas, and macquarie and then we're going to take a very brief look at uh some of the uh, key holdings in those that are doing incredibly well in the asx share market game but let's start with amcor ren one of the world's largest manufacturers of consumer products i think is the Packaging. world's largest it is i believe so wow yeah um 225 packaging plants around the world listed on the ASX. I think maybe dual listed also in the States, but um, AMC is the ticker here in Australia. Um, and I guess if you're thinking about where it fits, think about when you walk into a supermarket, most of the products on the shelves there are wrapped in Amcor created packaging. Uh, in produce or just, just generally? E just everywhere wow meat cheese sauces condiments beverages coffee pet food healthcare personal care products wow yeah and also uh, do they do cardboard as well Vizzy, Vizzy do, does cardboard but the Amcor do as well don't they don't know maybe not wow well have they reported well yeah net sales up 9% to 3.7 billion dollars profit was flat 270 million but on a constant currency basis Profit was up 7%. Okay. So, I guess the strong US dollar has, has hurt them. Yeah. Um, but the reason we found it interesting was the effect of inflation. US, oh, sorry, they, they overall, they've passed on 400 million US dollars in price increases in a quarter. Wow. Yeah. And 400 million in price increases and they made 3.7 billion. Wow. Um. So they, they have two main divisions, flexible and rigid packaging. In flexible, uh, $270 million in price increases, about 10%. Uh, 10% uh, they raise prices. In rigid, $130 million price increases, but that, which equates to about a 17% price increase. Wow. So you're wondering where inflation is in the system. Obviously, it's in things like energy. Um, and in like food commodities, we're seeing it. But we're also seeing it in the very packaging of all the products that we buy. Mm. And that's why inflation becomes really sticky and really hard to get out of the system because it's it's in everything. Yeah, once it's in, it's in. And you can sort of understand why. Like packaging, 
a lot of packaging is made from plastic, which comes from oil. So there's, it's exposed to the oil price, a lot of energy to make packaging, a lot of energy to recycle cardboard and make packaging out of that. Like it's just everything and then transport costs as well. And yeah. Mm, mm. Wow. Well, massive player, massive player. Let's move to Qantas. Yes. Alan Joyce, always in the news. Yeah. Always in the news. How have they reported? So, they they didn't technically report. They had a third quarter trading update, but uh, people got pretty excited because they announced that for the half that they're in now, they're back to profit. It's because they've cut their entire workforce. Mm. If, we lose, if we make a dollar for every flight we cancel and every yeah. bag we lose, we'll be back in profit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, yeah, they ex- they expect to make between four hundred and fifty and five hundred and fifty million dollars for the half in profit. Wow! So I think um, investors were obviously very excited about that. And um, after a few lean years, Alan Joyce might be getting a big bonus again. I actually don't think he had lean years to be honest. I think he got massive bonuses throughout. Well, yeah, there's there was an article in the AFR recently about. It. I mean, it, it happens every year. It, AGM rolls around. Joyce is up for multi-millions of dollars in remuneration and off the back of cutting workforce and this and that. And uh, it gets passed through and it rolls around and he gets multi-million again. So you got to hand it to him though. He, he definitely does turn this thing around time and time again. Mm. But um, yeah, I think they're debating now his $4 million annual salary. Okay. Yeah. I think he's one of the highest, if not the highest paid at behind uh, Shamara. Shamara, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> knowing how much CEOs are paid probably won't help you in the ASX share market game. <laughs> but uh, here's something that I found interesting in their trading update. Project Sunrise. Mm. Uh, Qantas are ordering 12 Airbus A350s capable of flying from Australia to, quote, any other city, including New York and London. Mm. Including New York and London is probably tautological if you say any other city. Yes. But um, starting from Sydney in, in late 2025, they'll have 12 planes that can that you don't have to stop. You can just fly anywhere. I mean, that give, that kind of freaks me out thinking about being on a plane for literally almost 24 hours. I think they did a test from Perth to London. Yeah. Or, or maybe even Sydney to London. And uh, these planes are going to be built, obviously with less capacity than the A380s and yeah, whatnot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they're, they're going to be built so that there's exercise space and, you know. Um, oh, really? Yeah. It's, they're done in a way so that um, you're not just going to be sitting for 24 hours because that is cooked. So when I say exercise space, it's not a gi- I mean, it's not a gym. I mean, let's but, um, <laughs> let's calm down the rhetoric on that's cooked. Like most of our lives are going to work and sitting down for eight hours, going home, sitting on a couch, and then going to bed. It's different though. <laughs> it's different though. You sit in that chair for twenty four hours and tell me it's not cooked. <laughs> it's different because you know you can't get up. Yeah, 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 you, yeah. and you just yeah, you're just there. But um, maybe have you seen um. You see it in like memes and stuff. There's these desks where they have little pedals and people like pedal at their desk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Maybe yeah. we need that on a flight. <laughs> but anyway, it will be good for travel for Australia. We're so far from anywhere. Anything that cuts tra- down travel time will be a blessing. But my, um, Yeah, my thinking was though, like, is this really just an Australian plane? Yeah. Like, are there any other countries that really need... No. Yeah. No. So, it's like people flying to Australia and then Australian Airlines flying to the world. Yeah. It's We've got big, our own plane. Yeah. Yeah, the Aussie plane. No other country as Let's well. Let's keep moving, man. <laughs> I so, guess New Zealand probably also can claim it. True. Macquarie. Yeah. So, uh, Amcor, uh, price inflation, Qantas, uh, flight time inflation, Macquarie. Just Making pro- money. Profit inflation. <laughs> <laughs> um, at some point, do, uh, they're, so, they're, they're amazing. But a- any company that's so amazing... It gets my antenna up. Why? It's like, can you be amazing forever? Yes. Really? Yes. Cool. <laughs> You're witnessing it. Next question. You're witnessing it. Yeah. So, well, yeah, but like charts only go bottom left to top right until they don't. The S&P keeps going top left to bottom <laughs> right. <laughs> Wait, bottom left to top right. <laughs> uh, so, Macquarie half one net profit up 13% year on year to 2.3 billion Aussie, I think. Um 
But interestingly, they make 72% of their income outside of Australia. Mm. So forget this idea that Macquarie is an Australian business. It is a global giant now Mm. to the point where we had a mate, shout out to Elton, who's in New York. And he was saying that he knew someone who was studying finance and or in that world and like Macquarie was like a coveted place mm. for people in San Francisco and New York to get a job. Yeah. And like Macquarie is taking it to the Goldmans and the JPs of the world. Fair enough. And you love to see that. Yeah. 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 Well, Ren, they're getting close to a trillion dollars in assets under management. A trillion Aussie. Well, a trillion, a trillion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I can't knock it. But we were, we were tossing it around in the office before. There are a few... Uh, asset managers that are in the trillion dollar club. There's Vanguard, which is at like ten trillion, or close to yeah. yeah. And then BlackRock, uh, and then State Street. Uh, BlackRock have iShares ETFs, and State Street have SPDR, SPDR. Um, I don't know if there's any others. No, I couldn't think of any. Um, but that just might be our knowledge more than anything else. But then there's a few that are next in line. And I was I saw that Macquarie had 800 billion assets under management. And I was like, could Macquarie be next in line? Then I saw it was Aussie dollars, mm. which translates to about 500 billion Still, US that's dollars. bigger than like KKR. Is it? Yeah. I think KKR is at high, 40, high 400s. Okay. Yeah. So I think next in line to get there is Blackstone, the private equity player. They've got about 950 billion. Um but I just, it just puts into perspective how big Macquarie is. Yeah, that's right, Ren. And it, it eats up... Um, is it Howard Marks? Bridgewater? No. Um, Ray Dahlia. Ray, is it Dahlia? Yeah. yeah. Bridgewater, $140 billion. Yeah. Biggest hedge fund in the world, yeah. Ray Dahlia. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so, a lot of Macquarie's money is in you know, infrastructure and stuff like that. Um, anyway, just really impressive. Really impressive company. Yeah. Um, Love to see it. Yeah. All right. So, uh, we've spoken about the ASX game. We've got uh, three portfolios of some of the players that have been jostling for a top spot over the last number of weeks. There's only two weeks to go. Shout out to the time of recording. And I know this is going to be a little bit late when it's released, but at the time of recording, Go Girl was sitting at the top of the leaderboard with a profit of $18,000 over the last uh, two months. The game started in... um, August. Um, and then we've got Eskimo's portfolio and Peter Jaden as well, who are all in um, positive territory, 16,000 profit or above. But Ren, the key call out for me is between the three portfolios, there are two stocks that they all hold. And that is Whitehaven Coal and uh, New Hope Corporation. <laughs> no, no. Whitehaven Coal is the only one that all three of them hold. Whitehaven, sorry, Whitehaven yeah, Coal, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and then, then between the other two, they also hold New Hope Corporation. Yeah, so coal. Coal, no surprises. So since the start of the game, Whitehaven is up 47% and New Hope is up 35%. But interestingly, it was up as much as 74 It's come off a bit over yeah. the last month or so. Yeah. And then um, Go Girl and Eskimo also hold Pilbara Minerals up 64% since the start of the game. Pil- uh, P- Pilbara? 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 What did Pilbara. I say? Pilbara. <laughs> Pilbara. 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 Anyway, not the point. So, um, resource heavy and uh, they've, they've played it well. I think the key takeaway from me, Ren, as well, is that these portfolios are pretty concentrated. None of them hold more than six stocks. In fact, GoGirl has four in hers and, and Peter Jaden has uh, only two. And uh, two of them are also fully invested. So, uh, not holding a lot of cash on the sides. That's the way that you'd think about playing a game over three months. Get the cash in there. Get it working. But uh, there's only two weeks to go. It's a great game. So, um, yeah, we'll be closing it out in a couple of weeks. But, Ren, that brings us to Book Bonanza. Final segment of the show. We are stoked to be joined by Lily, who's going to be... The first community member. Yeah, yeah. And hopefully not the last. So, let's get her up on the line. All right. So, we are joined by Lily for the second edition of Ren's Book Bonanza. Lily, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Now, uh, as we did last week, um, for those who haven't listened to last week, just a bit of context. I'm moving house and I'm too lazy to move the books that I've read to the new house. And so, I figured uh, let's give them away to... Uh, people that might want to read them. So, Lily, 
the rules of the game are simple. I've got three books here and three questions. If uh, and you're going head to head with Bryce, whoever gets more right wins. I guess. Um, if you win, you choose which book we send you. If Bryce wins, he chooses which book we send you. Nice. Uh, all makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Now, uh, before we get to the questions, just uh, for people watching at home, people watching on YouTube, I'll hold the books up to the camera. Um, the first book that we have, The Ethical Investor by Nicole Haddow. Now, we actually were interviewed for this book and I think we get mentioned. Um, so, a little bit of a narcissistic plug for ourselves there. <laughs> um, but all about ESG investing. The second book, uh, Shareplicity 2 by Danielle Akuye, uh, all about investing in the US stock market. So, uh, Lily, if you want to get your head around investing overseas, this is a good one. Uh, it's the, su- mm-hmm. the tagline is a guide to investing in the US stock market. Yeah. True, true to label. And then finally, because Simon didn't take it last week, we've got it back for another episode. <laughs> the third book is Get Started Investing by Bryce and I, uh, Lily, I'm not going to ask if you've read it, but if you haven't read it and you want it, uh, this might be your chance to get a free copy. Perfect. All right. Three books there. Uh, Lily, do you have your eye on any? Yes. Oh, okay. Which one? Which one? I won't tell you now. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. right. Nice. Keep us in suspense. All right. All right. So the uh, last week, the theme of the quiz was uh, big tech. This week, uh, oh. we're gonna we're gonna go airlines. Airlines. Yes. Oh, okay. We're, okay. we're into November. We're thinking about Christmas holidays. I'm thinking about travel. Airlines are on my mind. All not, right. Mm. Not that I'm flying anywhere this Christmas, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> um, three questions. Now, the first one, I couldn't find a profitable airline for the last year, so. Which of these four airlines- Didn't we just speak about Qantas? No, they're going to be profitable this coming year. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, obviously COVID interrupted, couldn't find any that made money. But which of these airlines lost the least amount of money in the in their last year? Okay. Um, Australia's Qantas, Ireland's uh-huh. Ryanair, America's Delta Airlines- or the owner of British Airways International Airlines Group. Lily, do you want to take a guess? Mm. Uh. <laughs> what was the second one? Uh, Ryanair, the the super budget European airline. They're super budget, aren't they? Yeah. Can't say I've ever been to Europe. You know what's funny is that I spent my last three years of education in COVID, so I haven't travelled. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. this is totally up my alley. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think just because I'm kind of hungry now, I'm going to hope that Qantas. Okay. So nice. I'm going to Qantas. Qantas. I'm oscillating between Ryan and Delta, and I think I'm going to go with um, Delta. Neither of you are correct. Oh, it was Ryanair. Oh, so Ryanair, lost, they lost 340 million euro. Uh, Qantas lost 680 million Aussie, even when you translate them. Uh, mm. Ryan lost the least. The other two lost in the billions. Um, so Ooh, okay. Lily, you were closer than Bryce. So you get the point <laughs> well, on that one. Damn, I should have backed <laughs> yes. myself. I okay. backed myself. <laughs> All right. Question two. Uh, this is a bit of a trans-Tasman rivalry question. Which mm-hmm. national carrier has had the better year Australia, uh, from a share market performance? Uh, Australia's mm-hmm. Qantas or New Zealand's Air New Zealand? Are we going Lily? Better? Yeah, Lily, you, you have yeah. a think and then you let us know which one you think. What share market does it Fun fact, I only started investing like a week ago. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> wow. Well, nice. I'm obviously so qualified. That's that's good. These books will um these books will be helpful. Help me. Yeah, yeah. So, especially get started investing. Shameless plug. I want to <laughs> say New Zealand. Air New Zealand, Bryce. Yeah, I'll also go Air New Zealand. Well, unfortunately, oh. both of you are oh, wrong. Wow. Qantas. So, wow. Okay. <laughs> so Qantas has uh, is up. 16% year to date for 2022 and New Zealand is down 20% oh, wow. year to date. 
So neither of you get the point. Lily, you are one up, which means Bryce <coughs> really needs one to. One up? Yeah, she got the first, she got the first one. She was close. Yeah, so wrong. she got the point. <laughs> <laughs> this is oh, this is the closest to the pin game. Also, this is my sure. game. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, this one, I don't expect either of you to know, but that's kind of the point of these questions. Um, but hopefully we all learn something. I certainly learned something making it because it's kind of fascinating. There are three giant airline alliances where global airlines all work together and I guess share a bunch of loyalty programs and points and routes and stuff like that. They are One World, which includes Qantas, British Airways, American Airlines and Cathay Pacific Mm -hmm. uh, amongst others. There's Star Alliance, which includes Air New Zealand, Air China, Air Canada, Lufthansa, Singapore Airlines. And then there's Sky Team, which includes Air France, China Airlines, Garuda, Korea Air, amongst others. So the question is of One World, Star Alliance and Sky Team, which is the biggest? Mm. Honestly, Star Alliance. Star Alliance, Bryce Lesky. Yeah. I'm going One World. One World. Well, you know what? Lily has absolutely nailed it. It is nice. Star Alliance. Yes. Oh my god! No way. <laughs> they I feel like Bryce is being nice. He knew the answer. Nah, he he really didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Star Star Alliance have 26 airlines and transport over 700 million passengers a year. Bryce, you said One World. They are actually the smallest with 13 airlines and 490 million passengers a year. And Sky Team is in the middle with 18 airlines and 630 million passengers a year. So there we go. Hopefully, we all learnt something about airlines. Lily, as the winner, uh, beating Bryce 2-0, which book would you like uh, to, to go home with? Um, the truth is, I want to have a single who won everything, but if I can get two signatures from you guys on your book, I'll take that. Deal. Deal. <laughs> oh, <easy. laughs> well, great. Well, Lily, thank you for joining us for Ren's Book Bonanza. We've got plenty more books to give away. Uh, so if you want to play, um, jump over to the Equity Mates Forum. Uh, we'll be looking for people uh, there. And I don't know what industry we'll do next week, but uh, can't wait to do it. Love it. Thanks, Lily. Thank you. All right, Ren. Well, great way to finish. Congrats to Lily. First win on the board from an Equity Mates community member. You've gone from- Wasn't my strongest day. You've gone from getting all three right last week <laughs> to not getting any. Yeah, no, I didn't. I just wanted to, I wanted to start soft. <laughs> <laughs> kidding anyway Ren that brings us to the end big episode but we will be back next week so uh, let's pick it up then sounds good I will say this about investing everything you do learn is cumulative what I learned at 20 is useful